If you can pass your cups to the center aisle. Um, we've had a, an amazing time of convention. And uh, this morning for the um, introduction, um, let's welcome Pastor Brian Coelho from Bangalore, India. Okay, greetings uh, to, to you. Been here for a few weeks, and just want to also greet the body in Bangalore. They watch the service live, uh, so that's amazing. Uh, we left this morning after the first service back to India, but we stop over in Stockholm in Finland for the conference. So that's a blessing. VJ also, who's been here for a year, comes with me. So we just uh, thank you for your hospitality. We've had a great time, and we have rejoiced in the Lord uh, together. Father, thank you for the morning here. Thank you that we can come into a place which we can call our own. Thank you that you call us your own. Bless this uh, word in Jesus' name. Amen. In the book of Hebrews, in the 11th chapter, in the 6th verse, the word of God says, Faith, by faith, it is impossible, without faith, it is impossible to please God. But those who come by faith must believe that God is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. The only condition that God imposes upon us in order to be blessed is faith. Isn't that amazing? Yes? I talk to the congregation in Bangalore because after being all these years, they sleep on my message. <laughs> so I have to wake them up. So I pause for some time. And I know if there's no response, that means something dangerous is happening. <laughs> so actually, that's because of the insecurity of, of, of me preaching. But that's okay. We can all rejoice in the Lord this morning. What a wonderful day yesterday. We watched fireworks on television. <laughs> in Pastor Jomi's house, in Mary's house, they had us over. We had a great time. In India, there's a week uh, that we, 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 the, 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 the nation celebrates. It's called the Festival of Lights. There's fireworks for one week. Starts at 6 a.m., ends at 11 p.m., and you are walled in by the sound. And when, when you have people that are not used to it, say, what is all that noise? We say, which noise? <laughs> the dogs are under the bed. They're kind of like, that is their, you know. But isn't it amazing that when we live in faith that God through his grace says that I will reward you and we become world in one sense because of this relationship. That means even though there are things that happen on the outside which are visible to the natural eye and perceived by all uh, is that which I'm confronted with, yet there is something mystical in this unique relationship with which I'm called by God. Abraham learned something beautiful here. I'll just get into it in a few moments. Because he is the person that was called by God in a unique sense. It says Abraham believed God and it was charged to his account. What was charged to his account? Righteousness. There used to be a time when we opened a bank account that you would have to deposit a certain amount of money for your account to be opened, correct? Now they put in some money into your account and open it for you. Very interesting. God has deposited something in us and he has opened our account for us. This account is accessible not by us, it has been made accessible by him. And he's called us into that life. It's mystical. And in this mystical life, he reveals to us the mystery of faith. In the book of Genesis, in the, 13th, uh, in the 12th chapter, I'll give this illustration and then I'll close. God is calling Abraham, and Abraham 
expresses this relationship into which he's called through worship. We often have also the ability and the opportunity and the privilege to express our relationship in God, with God through worship. Yes, our relationship is expressed through His Spirit, through His Word. When we come this morning and we worship together, it's a relationship that we express through worship. God is seeking that in John 4.24. It doesn't matter if we were sleeping half the time. It doesn't matter. It, it, what matters to God is He looks down and He's seeking for worshipers. And this is our expression to God for the gratefulness of what He has done for us through Christ. In Genesis chapter 12, uh, Abraham is told by God in verse 7, to your descendants I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who appeared to him. And he, in verse 8, called, he built an altar there and he called upon the name of the Lord. That's his expression of worship towards God. God called him out of the earth of the Chaldees. He had some transitions on the way. He pitches his tent between Bethel and Ai. He builds an altar. The altar is a memorial of an encounter of a person with God. And he names, usually the altar is named to give, and God reveals his name. With every successive revelation of God in the Old Testament, he reveals some manner of his nature. When we get into those places, in our crisis, in our situations. There is a, a illumination to us of his nature through the situation that we had before that did not comprehend. But we can say in times of distress, he has been faithful. In times of adversity, he has been our comfort and our joy. And as we begin to read here, it says beautifully, he began to call in the name of the Lord. In his journey, he, there was a famine, it says here in verse 10, and he went... I, I like this. It says here in verse uh, uh, tw uh, chapter 12, he went down to Egypt. Now we know that Egypt is a type of the world system and he uh, goes down there. There is no mention of an altar. We know that. We've read it before. But there's something that is that happens uh, to them. He knows that that is not the place he has to be in faith, but he knows that that is the place he has to go because of reason. There are many times situations may come up and reason tells us that this is the place you ought to be, but faith tells me that your place is at the altar. And because I am human and frail and have a sin nature, I, I listen to the dictates of reason and I leave the place of faith. But I like this uh, sense of humor that Abraham has when he goes to Egypt. He knows what will happen to him in terms of his life. So he tells his wife beautifully. He says, I know that you are a beautiful woman. That is not the place to commend her for her beauty. <laughs> a place of trouble is never to commend your wife for her beauty in order to save your skin. <laughs> and he knows he's in trouble. He knows, and he says, I know. And Sarah is looking at him and wondering. Interesting. So, he, so he, he tutors her how to respond. You can read it. They saw her in verse 15 as she was beautiful, and he was taken into Pharaoh's house. Abraham is in trouble. But this is what happens, which is very interesting. Abraham was treated well, and he got sheep and oxen and donkeys and male and female and servants and female donkeys and camels. What a wonderful way to be backslidden and be blessed. <laughs> it's very interesting. I mean, God, you said by faith. Faith, without its impulse to please. And faith is the, God is the reward of them. But there is no sense of Abraham diligently seeking him. He finds himself in trouble in the process of, get, of, of advancing in the kingdom of God. God struck Pharaoh and his household with a plague. Now, this is interesting. Pharaoh called Abraham and said, What is it that you have done to me? Why did you not tell me she was your wife? How did Pharaoh know that? Maybe Sarah said, You're going to be in trouble. <laughs> Maybe for the first time, Abraham said, She recalled it. He said, I'm beautiful. But God revealed to Abraham, uh, to Pharaoh, that 
she was Abraham's wife. It doesn't matter where we are in our decisions. God is concerned for me, even though I may not be in the will of God. He instructs Cyrus to let Israel go into the promised land. Even though in Isaiah 45, verse 4, he said, You are Cyrus, I call you by name to let my people go. Even though you have not known me. Even though Cyrus had not been known by God, God moved Cyrus to let his people go. God, in his sovereign grace, takes care of those details in my life that I, with human reason, contemplate when I should be in a position of exercising faith in the kingdom of God. And I'll close with this, that. Uh, why did you not tell me? Why did you say she is my sister? So he's, he's going. I like this uh, place. When he leaves, it says, Abraham went down to Egypt. And in 13.1, it says, Abraham went up from Egypt. The moment I step into faith, God immediately visits him, me, with his grace. For faith is the only provision to receive something that I don't deserve, something that is unmerited, something that is unrestrained in its capacity, something that is unconditional, and something that is much more than I can even ask or think. And then, he's, and then this is beautiful here. Uh, I'd like to close with this. Verse 3. He went on his journeys from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where the tent had been. I like this expression, at the beginning. So he built an altar, departed from it, and then found himself to go exactly to the place of that altar. It says he found where he built it at the beginning. In God's work of restoration, he does not take into account the years of unbelief. That is, we call in the English grammar, parenthesis, you know, when, when there is something you want to write. I mean, I, I won't write this letter to you in brackets. You are a crazy person, close the brackets. And then you say, <laughs> and then you say this, is, this is not in the original. And then you go on. This is what God does. Here I am following God in faith. And then something happens to me. I go to Egypt. And from the time I'm in Egypt till the time I come out of Egypt, God does not take that into account. Because he cannot impute that which is not by faith to me. That was imputed to Christ. Abraham learned something in his walk of faith. He's not rationalizing why he went to Egypt. He's making a decision immediately to come back to that place where he had met God in, in faith, in worship. He is not dealing anymore in trying to apologize for everything. His coming to the altar in faith, to the place where he was in the beginning, is an expression of his repentance in his own heart for having deviated from the specific will of God, which was revealed in the fact that he came back to the altar at the beginning. When we reach heaven at the Bema seat, there is a verse in 1 John 2.28, and sometimes that verse scares, us, scares me because it says that we will experience some measure of shame at his coming. That shame cannot be in, in relationship to my sin because it was paid for. That shame is in relationship to God showing me that all those years of unbelief that you lived is in parenthesis. It can never be imputed to me, but I, I, I have lo I, I, I experienced that for a moment because I, could, I realized I could have made an impact, and I didn't. And those years were taken out, not in condemnation, because God could not add anything to my account in terms of my rewards, because that is something that maybe dishonored him in terms of my life, but cannot be imputed to me in terms of sin. You understand? So suppose I have 25 years by faith and I didn't walk for 10 years. 15 years would be there. And I would say, God, what about the 10 years? God will be silent to me about the 10 years. Then I will realize those 10 years, even though his grace was there, I did not respond in faith. I was living in reason. But sin can never be, imp I mean, I can never be ashamed because of what I did. I would be ashamed for the loss of opportunity that I had to serve. This revelation Abraham received at the altar, and he did not at any moment of time want to waste. He was just happy that he was back at the altar, and the scripture said to the spirit, 
it was at the beginning. Isn't that amazing? That we are renewed here, we hear the word, we are constantly fed, we are taught, we are edified, we are built up, people are available, and then we go astray for and in 15, chapter 4 of the book of Luke, the shepherd comes after us to tell us, don't get preoccupied with the, wa with the lost and wasted years. Just get into that place where I am waiting to reward you. Amen. Father, we thank you. Right. In Jesus' name, amen. What a good uh, finished work message that was. Pastor Brian, thank you. Building us up in grace, in the mystery of Christ. Uh, let's look in a few verses as we, before we start our message for Ephesians chapter 6. I'd like you to notice, notice this verse. Ephesians 6. So we've come together to study the word and appreciate the mysteries that are in Christ. In Ephesians 6, in verse 19. And for me, praying, praying, as in verse 18, praying for me, we pray for all the saints, in verse 18, and for me, that utterance, this is the Holy Spirit anointing, the unction that may be given unto me, this must be how the ministry happens, that the Holy Spirit gives the utterance, that I may open my mouth boldly, without intimidation, but with confidence and boldness and the truth to make known the mystery of the gospel. The mystery of the gospel. So not only reason, but the mystery of the gospel or the revelation or illumination of the gospel, as we just heard from Pastor Brian. Now, uh, on, your pay, on your seat or every other seat, every third seat is your, your series card for this month of July and in August. And we have the words, ears, hands, eyes, feet, tongue, knees. So I'm going to draw a person here. And, um, okay, so we have... Isn't that interesting, that picture there? Okay. We have the ears. Let's put ears on him. <laughs> Big. Ears. What's the next part? Hands. And then eyes. And feet. And knees. Oh, tongue, sorry. Tongue, very important, and then knees, yeah. So every Sunday, we'll have a message on these body parts, the parts of our body that are instruments of God, that are used by God in our everyday life and in our ministry in everyday living. And so today is ears. This is the, the message for today. And we are wanting to set the, the record or set the orientation for it from Romans chapter 12. So turn there with me, please, to Romans 12 and... And then one other verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I read chapter 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Would you say that with me, please? 
Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Say, ask your neighbor for a second. Are you a new creature? Go ahead. Are you? Are you a new creature? Then ask them. Of course, they said yes because they're here in the church. Of course, yes, I am. And they probably know that as well. Then say, in which way are you a new creature? How is it you're a new creature? Here's the answer. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, of the word of God, which lives and abides forever. John 3, unless a man is born from above, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. When, when we believed in Christ, then not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but by his mercy, he has regenerated us. We are born of the spirit, born with a new heart. We have very important words, spirit and heart. Both words are used in Ezekiel 36. When God says, I will do a new thing, I will do a new thing for my people. I will do a new thing. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. Now, many of us have believed in Christ and born again, and then we kind of move on and live a natural life and handle the details of life. Let me draw another picture here. And we have here, let's say, here's the person, and here is, here is the life he normally lives. And I'll put here the word details. Even religious details. I'll give you an example. He lives a Christian life. And usually he is occupied with behaviors. Put it here, the word behaviors. He, uh, the Sabbath is a good example. He is now a Christian, and he may go to some church where they say in the church, the Sabbath day is a day of rest. The Sabbath is very important. It is one of the commandments of God. You, you must keep the Sabbath holy. And he's there as a, as a believer, and he, he's like saying, yes, God said that, and that is what I must do. But he's making a whole mistake. Normally, usually, it's very easy and something that happens often. And it is behind the details. Let's do a, a color here. Come on, here we go. Let's do a color. Behind the details is a whole world that's very important to God. There's a whole life that God gave the believer. God gave the believer a new heart and a new spirit. God gave the believer a new mind. God gave the believer a new way of thinking. But oftentimes, he, he, in the naturally, he just says, you know, how am I doing in terms of my, my life, my behavior, even my attitude? I say I have a good attitude. Maybe then he hears the word humility and submission and faith and obedience. And all these are great words. But they are also words that people hear in the natural world. Like when you go to work, you are to obey and you're to be responsible and to be obedient and to be submiss submitted and cooperate with the people at work. 
And he is saying, yes, that's right. That, that is how I should live. But Christ is saying to us in the word here, and I want to draw your attention to it. Go, go back to 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17, and you'll understand me in a few minutes. Verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. He is a new creature. He is a, another nature now. There is the birth of Christ in him. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now up on our diagram, what I'm talking about is the red there. What has become new is the whole background of my life. Now God is my father. He wasn't before. Now the Bible is the book. It wasn't before. Now my sisters and my brothers are brothers and sisters. They were not before. Now I have eternal life. I didn't have it before. Now I am free by God's own blood. And I had a meditation on the blood of Jesus washing me of my sin the other day. And I just enjoyed thinking about the blood of Jesus washing my wicked, perverse, vile sin away. Then I had this thought on hypocrisy. I want to share that too in a second. But go back to 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. There, it says, old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now look at our diagram. Details. Religious, when I say details of life, action, behavior, route of travel, um, people I know, all the details of life. These also have taken on another way. I see things differently because of the context of them. They're not the same. When I eat my lunch, it is not the same as when I eat my lunch because the context is different. Oh, yes, I chew the food the same. Yes, my body reacts the same. Yes, I like that food the same and so on. But I'm saying something that's very important that many, many times we overlook it. The context of our life, our whole life has, has been at the fundamental levels, at the very place where you are deeply living deep in your heart. There, instead of despair, there is hope. I read a fascinating story about a man who was told he had cancer. Listen to this. Two years ago, he had been told he had terminal cancer. He and his wife went home to cry and then to die. Should they keep it a secret? They prayed. The answer was that they should play about it. What do you mean, play? So they decided to give a good party. They invited all their friends. During the festivities, Orville, that was his name, held up his hand to make an announcement. You may have wondered why I called you together to this. This is a cancer party. I have been told I have terminal cancer. Then my wife and I realized we were all terminal. We decided to start a new organization. It's called MTC, Make Today Count. You are all charter members. Since that time, the organization has grown across the country. Orville has been too busy to die, <laughs> pointing out the way we Christians are to play into the jaws of death, singing, loving, not losing a minute. 
from the joy of the world cannot give nor take away. Something to think about. Do you see what we're saying by our, our, our understanding here? Everything is different. Everything is different. Even how we see disease and death, how we see our friends, our problems, divorce, heartache, and pain. Everything is different. We are born of God. We are seeing things through God. This is amazing. Now turn with me to Romans 12, please, and see how it is written there by the apostle who has gone through the book of Romans writing about our justification by faith, writing about our victory over sin, chapter 6, 7, 8, writing about our failure and our trouble, writing about the Jewish people, 9, 10, and 11, and now he goes to body life in chapter 12. Pastor Shabelli mentioned it in the communion, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren. When he says beseech, he's pleading. He's really pleading because he sees something. This is very important in our picture here. Why are we pleading? Because of those red lines in our picture, meaning we are seeing something by the Spirit of God, and we are pleading with others. The Sabbath day. What about the Sabbath day? Well, Jesus said, I am the Sabbath. Christ is giving us the word rest. Come unto me, all ye that labor, labor and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke, it is easy. My burden is light. I give you myself. So Sabbath for us is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Even when we are under a lot of stress and trouble. Because of our new birth and the new heart and spirit, then we have a understanding of the details. We could also put in here not just a detail, but Job and his suffering, which would be terribly difficult to manage, Job's suffering. But how quickly we gravitate to the, the problem. And we say, God solved my problem. And God says, I gave you my son. We say, thank you very much for your son, but solve my problem. And the Lord answers and says to us, I am really the answer. Abide in me. Yesterday, we were soul winning in the rain. We went up to the Amish market in Joppa Town and went into the cafeteria area. And I sat with a man for an hour and uh, we talked. And he had some questions and we had a good ta time and we had a prayer at the end. And it was very satisfying and joyful to me to, to hear good questions and and to give answers. One of the things I said to him, I said, you know, you don't know about the details of life, what is, what's going to happen to you. He shared that he almost died a year ago. He has a lung disease now. And I said, you know, we, you have questions about life, but it's like your mother driving up in the car, pulling up in the parking lot, sending somebody in and saying, Tell Tim, to my, I'm here, go, get in the car. So Tim, your mother's here, get in the car. She goes, what she's doing here? What's going on? Where are we going? It doesn't matter, it's your mother. Get in the car. Tim, get in the car. 
it's your mother. So normally anybody, you know, we would get in the car. Mom is here. Mom is driving. Get in the car. All the other things will come, come along. But you have to be with the right person. And what I'm saying is that God is pulled up in the car. And he said, Tim, get in. And you don't know about the details. You don't know what's going to happen, but you know the one that's driving the car. You know the one that will really take care of you. You know the one that really has your interest in mind. Get in the car. And we get in the car. Why, Why is this normal for us? Because when we are born again, now we become a friend of God, a child of God. Now we have a person that no matter how painful life will be, we have a person that will never forsake us and never fail us. We have a person that will always talk to us and always give us, what is our first word in our card here? Ears. That's the first word here. Ears. This is what has happened to us. We have ears to hear now. That's why we, we love gathering at our convention, because we came together because we have the same ears. Why? Because our hearts easily eclipse our heart, our fallen sin nature, eclipse our ears. I don't want to hear. I don't want to hear. Remember when they stoned Stephen, that Jewish crowd, they were so angry with Stephen, and it says they closed their ears, and they just took him out and they stoned him. And I think this whole debate in our country about um, homosexuality and all of these things, there are some people that are just close their ears and they just are of another nature. And let's get comfortable with this, that there are people that, are, that have very little capacity, that this is the world we live in. There are people that are blind in Christ, so let them alone. Let the blind lead the blind. But I will decide what life I live. I will decide what is in my heart. I may not change others. And I, of course, we are evangelizing because that is what we believe about our faith, that there are people that are sick and tired of sin and of religion and of details and behaviors and tired of suffering and pain. And so we have a message, because look at how we live. It's the red uh, background that, that allows us to see, I love these people. I love these people that are in trouble. I love these people that are blind. I love these people that don't understand. They don't understand us. They, many times we are, we are painted in the profile of um, blind, narrow-minded, bigoted, uh, selfish, religious, uh, self-occupied, narrow, hard, calloused Christians. But let that be. That's fine. It's really none of my business, as long as I am not that way myself. And I am not. We are not. We are those that are born of the Spirit. We are people that are fascinated by what is being said in this great book. These are the words that lead us unto salvation in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And I hope what I just said about Christians isn't hurtful to you, but I want you to understand, and I'm sure you know, that that is, uh, that is the world saying it. But they said it about Jesus, that he had a demon, and that he was a danger, and he was a problem to Israel, and get rid of him and crucify him. Well, he said in John 15, 18, 
If they hate me, they will hate you. So fine, very well then, let it be as it is. Very well then, let, let's go. As for us, we are in love. In varying degrees at different times, we are in love with God. We are drawn to him. Let's read it. Verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Let's go through the parts of the body. Here they are. Uh, ears, hands, eyes, feet, tongue, knees. I don't think God cares about the knees of a cow, but he loves the knees of a man or a woman that is submitted to him. I don't think he cares about the, the um, ears of a cow or a bull or a goat or a sheep. But us, we are living sacrifices. He has much more pleasure in us because of our hearts and our minds, the spirit of our mind, our mind, an amazing gift. There, the world is filled with brilliant people, and their minds are without God. The spirit of the mind in Ephesians 4, and 23 is another spirit. So their spirit, the mind is used as a tool. The mind is used as an organ of operation. And in their mind, they imagine in, in Psalm 64. In their mind, they have an Im imagination in their mind. They devise plans. They so decide, they figure out how they steal. They, they decide they can they have a criminal mind they have a, a lustful mind they figure out how they they're very clever this a, a a mind that is very gifted but used by another spirit but what about us well it says here our bodies are presented to God a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable, logical service. It's almost like if God gave me a, his heart and spirit and enlightened my mind, then it is only reasonable that my hands would be used for a holy purpose. My eyes would be used for a holy purpose to read the Bible, to look in the face of a child, to teach somebody something, to be a listener. Our bodies are now tools of God in this world. Verse 2, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I don't want to be long this morning, but I want you to understand something. As you came out to church this morning, to listen to the word. Conforming, it goes like this. Inside the believer, inside is that change. So he's on the inside, he is different. So now, on the outside, it harmonizes with the inside. But there's something that happens sometimes with people, and it goes like this. What is on the outside is not in harmony with the inside. Inside, they're a child of God. But on the outside, they're partying. And in the party, as they party, they're conforming to the world. But this conforming with, to the world is not in harmony with the true nature of the person. The true nature of the person is that they are holy. 
that they are born of God, that they are a new creation. Uh, so as a new creation, they go now to like the party and they are there tr having their time, but there's something in them, it troubles them. They don't have the witness in them that this is in accordance with their new birth. This is in accordance with God. And they are grieved because they grieve the Holy Spirit. They are disappointed with themselves. They say, oh, I'm in the world. I'm saying everything that the world is saying. I'm agreeing with my friends. I'm walking in harmony. I'm in the world. I am conforming to the world. And Paul realizes that this can happen to the believer. And he says to the believer, do not conform to the world. But let your inner nature, the, the inner nature that you have, let the inner nature be in harmony with your outer activity, your outer life, how you live, who you are with, what you say, how you think. Let this be the salt and the light that is in the world. Let what you are inside be in the world that you live in. Let's read it. Verse 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There it is. That's what I need. My mind renewed. That's it. That's what I need, the Holy Spirit to renew my mind. Now, this renewal word is the same word for when Jesus prayed in Matthew 17, and he sh was shining like snow. He was white, that he was transformed. It means the inner nature of Christ came through his body. Well, in the same way, who we are that is in Christ Jesus comes through in our, in our stumblings, in our weaknesses, in our sickness, um, in our simple faith, in our words, in our testimony. It comes through. And in our ears. Our ears are new ears. We hear what we hear the words. We hear the melody of the music. We hear the voice of our friends. We hear righteousness. We hear the message, and it resonates with us. We say, there it is. That's it. That's what it is. Amen. I believe that. that there it is. I was looking for that. That is food for me. That is the anointing of God. That is the fellowship in the body. That is the harmony of God's kingdom on the earth that is also in me. I don't want to be conformed to the world. I've been there. I've been acting like the world, been at the party, did everything there and all that, and I would go home and I would just say, I'm not, I don't like it. I think it's foolish. Vomiting on the sidewalk, laughing at stupid jokes or making fun of people or arrogance and all of those things, uh, the, the foolishness or the silliness of it all, or even at the university pretending to be an intellectual or pretending to be an athlete or pretending to be a high society person or whatever it might be, pretending to be, but deep inside you aren't really, who you really are is given to you by the spirit in your mind. The spirit of your mind. This is when Jesus tells you who you are and you enjoy it. The spirit of your mind renewing your mind. And now you hear your brothers and your sisters, you, you're kind of simple, humble. You, you are loving. You are kind. You care about others. You're not so selfish in our interests. We become a minister of life, just it happens because we are born again. So there it, is. there it is. In verse 2, we'll finish. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing 
of your might, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Wow. It's like this is what we got. I don't know about the Supreme Court justices. That's crazy. But thank God I'm not in their shoes. They're accountable to many. But that's, I just want to know, am I in God's perfect and acceptable and holy will? Wow. If we have that, wow. The whole world can be moved, but not you. I mean, you and I in the perfect and holy and acceptable will of God for every one of you that are here and this morning. This is amazing. We may prove what is the perfect, holy, and acceptable. And by the way, when you've been out of his will, and that, ha that happened, I live in this, I, I sin, I'm out of his will, I don't like it. Has that ever ha happened to you? I don't like it. I'm out of his will. I don't know. I don't like it. I, the first thing I care about is I, I want to fear him. I want to trust him. I, I want to grow in him. I want to know him. I don't like it. We don't like it because it contradicts our nature. That we are children. We are children of our heavenly father. We are obedient. We learn obedience by the things we suffer. We are learning faith. We delight in his will. We enjoy his righteousness. We are learning to hear what he has to say. And this is the evidence of an obedient child is that when, listen, wise reproof on, an, on the ear of an obedient child is like a ring on his ear, a gold ring on his ear. Well, let's say it this way. You have a, a believer and he loves it. He loves to hear Psalm 119. And let me close with this. Would you read Psalm 119 for the, through the summer? Read chapter, read the chapter, 119. Read it again, read it backwards, read it forwards, start in the middle, read it forwards, read it from the middle, go backwards. Read it again, read it again, read it again. You will enjoy it and wait on God and listen to what God says. Oh, it's amazing, Psalm 119. How does a man's life change? Psalm 119. How does a man change from sin? Psalm 119. How, how does a, a man love the brethren? Psalm 119 says it. I, I, I am friends with all those that fear the Lord. Great peace have they that love your word. Nothing will offend them. I am concerned about a church when only the pastors study the Bible and not the people. The people study the Bible because we have ears now. We do, and we hear them. Hear old messages from Dr. Stevens. Hear the messages that built the ministry. Go back and hear them again. Learn it all over again in humility, and it'll build you up because this is our new nature. Our minds are renewed. When you're disobedient, ask God, Lord, I have sinned or failed, not only by what I do, what I haven't done, I should have done, sins of omission. And I say to the Lord, Lord, your grace is sufficient for me. Your grace builds us up. Your grace will lead and guide us. Your grace is enough. Yes, Lord, give me ears. And then if you don't like the preacher, you ask God, God, help me to love the preacher. Help me to love the preacher. Pray for the preacher. And God bless our church. And if you have an attitude, a stubborn, nasty, snitty little attitude, just little, you're a little nasty, little petty, little dee -dee 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 -dee, then, then it's like, God, what a little person I am. Me, I love out of my heart. I have mercy towards everybody. Would I follow Jesus and have the same love and joy that Jesus had and be in the church and be a minister of Christ and not so wrapped up with myself? I need ears, new ears, circumcised ears, 
ears from a new heart. Books, read books, be a reader, read books, little books, not big, thick. Little, read books and devotional prayer, meditate, shut everything down electric in your house, live like an Amish person <laughs> in the shed for a day. And read and meditate and pray and believe and be restored and renewed and built up and then obey God in every area of your life. And believe God for something more for than your small, uh, your, your little world and my little thing here, you know, my thing. And Jesus said, ah, oh, it's nothing. Cancer, oh, it's nothing to me. Yeah, but suffering, Lord, say my grace is sufficient. Have a party, celebrate, get all your neighbors, have a cancer party. Say, hey, hey, listen, I don't have much choice. Let's go for it. I got a renewed mind. We're having a celebration. God's in control, and I want to declare Christ to the whole world. What a mind. What a way of thinking. Amen. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for our convention. The month of June was our mission month. Now we are in July, and we are sanctified and learning to be soul winners, messengers of Christ, sharers of the word, to be listeners. Lord, thank you. Bless our summer, keep us from evil, guide us in the way. We need to hear about our ears in every area, all parts, and to hear what you have for us this summer and in our lives year-round in your perfect will. And anyone here who is not a born-again child of God, today is a day for you. And in India, and in China, and around the world, say to Christ, I trust you and I will turn from my own ways. I will repent from my own life and I will trust you with all my heart. I'll put away the sin. I, I will look at Jesus and he will put it away for good. And though I, I will not be perfect in this life, yet I will follow and know and experience that I am a new creation. And the old things are passed away. Raise your hand if you're asking Jesus in your life this morning, saying yes to Jesus. Raise your hand, please, anyone at all. Yes to Jesus. Oh, we want salvations this summer. We want salvations, Lord. We want salvations in our church this summer. We want our church to be full this summer. We want people to come to you this summer. We want changes to happen in the hearts of people. We want your grace poured out. We want people to repent from their own way and experience your grace and know you personally know you as a gracious, loving, living God. In Jesus' name, amen.